Welcome to the School of Resistance at Akademie der Künste Berlin, a film and discourse series that connects art and activism. My name is Kasia Wojcik and together with my colleagues Eline Banken and Martin Valdez Stauber, I'm curating the discourse series School of Resistance, which connects art and activism. What strategies and tools can we use to create valuable alternatives for our future? How is art and activism entangled? Where do these two forms of practice meet? How do they influence each other? Today, we discuss the possibilities, conditionings and problems of transnational justice and injustice. How can debates about global injustice be addressed with aesthetic means, but also legally, scientifically? What would a global jurisdiction mean? Are projects such as the Congo Tribunal breaking ground and creating utopian possibilities for a new law? And um, for that, I'm very proud to speak about this today with two experts of the field in their own practices. And first of all, I would like to introduce the audience to both of them. Miriam Sagemas is a lawyer and the vice legal director at the European Center for Constitutional and Human Rights where she coordinates the Business and Human Rights Program. She has worked on various cases against corporations, including proceedings against Lidl relating to the exploitation of workers in Bangladesh and Pakistan, and against companies trading in cotton picked by forced child labor in Uzbekistan. Lara Stahl is a researcher, writer, artist, and curator. Between 2013 and 2016, She worked as a programmer for the theatre producer Frascati, where she developed various projects between art and other fields on the basis of shared urgencies. For example, international law, whose law or out of state. Since 2017, she has been working as a freelance curator in the realm of the performing arts and has realized projects such as The Evening of Anger, together with rapper Gideon Everduim, and Europe on Trial, together with human rights activist Yunus Osman Noor. Since 2018, she is involved at Antigent with various artistic projects. Antigent is one of the partners of School of Resistance and producers. Okay, um, that was a long introduction. But first of all, I would like to start off the conversation by introducing a case that just recently got media attention. In February 20. One, uh, 2021, the UK Supreme Court granted the residents of the Niger Delta the right to sue Royal Dutch Shell in British courts for environmental pollution. Thus, Nigerian farmers and fishermen can sue the oil company Royal Dutch Shell in English courts for environmental pollution. And I would like to end this introduction with a quote from Donald Pauls, who is a director of a Dutch NGO, This is a warning to all corporations involved in injustices around the world. Victims of pollution, land theft or exploitation now have a greater chance of winning legal battles against such corporations. Miriam, um, could you explain about the importance of this case in the field of global law? Um, because for what I, I understood in this case was it didn't get that much media attention as it maybe should have. Yes, I'm, uh, this is indeed a really important judgment. And um, I felt, because those it was, I think, first in the Netherlands and then a week later the UK Supreme Court decided and it was, I found this very exciting. Um, and all of my colleagues who are working on this topic as well, and you're right, it, for whichever reasons it didn't make it so too much into the news. But I think why this judgment is so important is that we need to understand that um, global economy and globalized economy is organized through law, a lot of times through company law or through commercial law. And this, these laws are um, particularly made up to outsource responsibility. So under normal company law, um, Royal Dutch Shell with its headquarters both in the Netherlands and in the UK is not supposed to have any responsibility towards what is happening in their subsidiaries in Nigeria. Although it's super clear financially, they are the ones that are, you know, coordinating all the efforts and also obviously all the profits end up at the headquarters. 
Um, so, but the law, in principle, at least economic law, is designed to exactly leave people that are like uh, people in the Niger Delta is exactly to leave them without remedy, without justice. Um, and now this, those two rulings, um, which have been litigated forever in courts. Now, you, you, we can't forget that uh, the Dutch case, I think it took 13 years to come to this stage. Um, and also in the UK, the litigation has started somewhat in the late 1990s, not on this particular case, but sort of to be building up casework that was able then to lead to this uh, decision. And now um, both courts have found that Companies that have a headquarters in Europe and have operations elsewhere bear an own duty of care towards environmental and human rights impact of their subsidiaries. Of course, there are a couple of conditions of that, but I think this is the key message. It, it, despite the fact that you are organizing yourself through company law so that you don't bear responsibility for all the costs, the human costs, the environmental costs that you create you do still have your own duty. And if something goes wrong, you may be liable for this. Um, and another aspect that is very important, especially in the UK, is that the court has said, we're determining the responsibility by your own policies. And that means company policies, to some extent, are legally relevant, which is, I find, also really important because normally companies say, oh, well, yeah, we have this wonderful policy on environmental whatever mm -hmm. protection. And then you go, oh, well, so <laughs> what does it mean? And then they say, well, but it's just a policy. You know, it has nothing to, you know, no one can claim a right from this. And at least the Supreme Court has made us a, an important step in this regard. Thank you for explaining that to me and our audience. And connecting to that, I would really like to know more of the work that the ECCHR is doing. So, please, <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> yeah, so um, uh, we are, we're mainly lawyers. Not all of us are lawyers, but uh, we also have researchers and, um, uh, and uh, people from policy fields. But we're mainly lawyers. And um, our aim is we want to use law um, and we want to use legal procedures um, to counter power. And, um, of course, we, we are working in the field of, of human rights, so we are working on uh, cases of torture, we're working on uh, human rights violations at the European borders. And where I'm particularly working on, it's about holding European companies to account for human rights violation abroad. And um, the idea is um, that we feel it's particularly as an organization that is located in Europe, that is located in Germany, and also... Um, that that it's, it's, you know, the legitimacy of our work is that we're criticizing European actions um, and, and those that are in power um, and not so much looking around on <laughs> everyone else's mistakes. Mm -hmm. um, and how we go about this is we have, um, we have created a wider network of or people, organizations that do similar work or people that are more in activism. Um, around the world in Africa and Latin America and Asia and we are regularly discussing uh, certain topics so we've um, in through those discussions we've we've um, uh, come to sort of three core areas we are generally working on and in networks that we are also um, engaged in so one is um, companies involvement in conflict and wars and cooperation with repressive regimes. And there we have been for the last years, we have been particularly working on uh, holding companies, European arms trading companies to account for arms deliveries they are making um, uh, in the, la the last two cases we have been on Yemen. So we are holding them to account if, you know, German, but other also European companies delivering arms to Saudi Arabia that are then being used um, in Yemen on, for attacks against civilians. The other um, area we are working on is the question of labor exploitation and global supply chains. Um, that's also an area that I'm, I don't know, I'm, I've been working for, for a very long time. Um, where also, again, the aim is um, yeah, to, to help workers claim their rights from the lead firms in those supply chains that where usually the power really is, that do set the conditions of, uh, of, um, of the production process. And with that all the human rights abuses and environmental harm that comes with it. And then the third area, <clears throat> we're looking more into the agribusiness resource um, uh, area, and there we are looking at responsibility of pesticides, company, large industrial companies, 
um, but also the responsibility for of um, companies well involved in green energy, but actually you know just replicating the same exploitive mm. methods as uh, any other resource. Uh, you know, as an oil company would do but in terms of, you know, the social consequences of, you know, creating a wind park uh, in Mexico or um, mm -hmm. elsewhere, so land grabbing, you know, uh, uh, repression against people that are opposed and so on. Thank you. Um, that brings me to my personal question that I have to you, but also to you, Lara, um, because I think it's a question to all of us and to the audience. It's, um, I remember speaking uh, to uh, the Pakistani trade unionist Nazir Mansoor um, about the fatal unemployment of Pakistani garment workers during the first lockdown in March 2020 as the corona pandemic shut down global supply chains as we know it. And he told me that not to buy these products, so garment products, is tragic for the workers involved. So massive unemployment, all of that. And then my question is to you both, um, what do you think or could be the responsibility as a global citizen, also from your practice as a lawyer, but Lara, your practice as an artist, um, how can I support these workers and, and their struggles? Or how can I support other people who are facing injustice? Yeah, um, <clears throat> I think to start with, um I think yes, the pandemic and and um, has been. I think Bangladesh has been within a, two or three weeks. It has been basically the whole industry, like the whole country, has been close to collapse um, because as the demand broke down, the textile companies are in such a powerful position that they were just able to say, "We're not even paying for goods that are being delivered right now." Mm. Um, because we don't want to, because we don't know when we're going to sell them. And it, it sort of showed so much about the power structures. And uh, we've also looked at contracts and it was completely illegal. They had no grounds to say that. But just because they can and they know they're not going to be sued by any of the suppliers, they could. Um, and yes, it shows, it, what this shows is how much we are connected and entangled. Mm. Um, and yes, so obviously a boycott of H&M or whoever you want is, is not the solution because people's life depends on this. Um, at the same time, I would say, well, you know, I think we, we need to think about how can a just transition look like because this system is not, it's, it can't go on like this. We have planetary boundaries. Um, clothes are getting always cheaper and cheaper. Um, the, and as clothes are getting cheaper and cheaper, what is ending up with supplier firms is less and less. And that means workers have to work more for less mm. so that they produce more, so that we can consume more. So because we also, <laughs> also wages are not rising here, no, in, mm. in Europe either. So it's, clothes must be cheaper so we can buy more. And then we have those huge, uh, you know, masses of clothes that no one can wear and that need to be thrown away. So obviously it's, it's, a, it's a vicious circle. And I don't think that it's about only our cons personal consumptions, consumers' choices that will stop this. Mm. I do think we knew every one of us needs to think about what are my ethics about my consumption um, but I think it's a completely neoliberal idea that, uh, you know, I will make the world better by drinking the right coffee or by buying the right clothes or not buying clothes. Mm. Uh, I don't think that th this is the way we, what we really need is we need structural changes. Um, and therefore I think it's a lot and leaves us with, uh, not ethical consumerism, but, but much more, we need to be politically engaged and probably also try to use our helplessness and our anger that this creates, right? Mm. Because I think we, we can't avoid profiting from exploitation. It's just um, unless you decide to, you know, completely withdraw yourself from everything. But unless you, you don't do that, you, you can't avoid this. And the question, how do we use this? And how do we, um, and I think, you know, how do we engage? And for example, struggles for better rules. You know, this is something that's being debated currently in, in a lot of countries in Europe that we say we want other rules and we want our companies to obey those so that we, we, we don't have, it's not my responsibility which product I, call, I buy so to make sure that it has been hopefully produced under good circumstances, no? So, um, and I think there are other ways of, 
you know, there there are some initiatives that create those bound bonds between workers in Bangladesh and uh, workers also, for example, in H and M uh, uh, shops and so on. Of course, there are those smaller initiatives, but I think in general, it's we must be understanding ourselves as also political agents and as citizens. Mm -hmm. That's interesting, Lara. For you, when I say, when when I am asking about the responsibility of a political citizen, what what does that mean for you in the terms of justice? Um, I think I can very much relate to what Miriam just said. I think there's something dangerous about um, trying to answer this question on an individual level, and I think that's what happens a lot. What do you do? And it's almost this unconscious argument, like, if you don't recycle everything, stop buying, well, how can you blame society? You know, start first with yourself. And I think that's a very <clears throat> dangerous discourse. And it um, also make, creates a situation in which we don't feel we can, as people, live responsibility at our governments, live responsibility at our, um, the, co the corporations, organize ourselves create mass protests, etc. Because we're constantly mm, mm, put back into this individual position. So I think that's very dangerous. Still, it's a relevant question. And of course, I think it's easy uh, to think, oh, I'm a, I'm a good man. I'm at the, at the right side of history. You know, I think about all these things. And then if you speak to um, someone really living at the place where if I buy that trousers at H.A.M. Uh, makes a huge difference. It's important to hear that and to understand that things are much more complex than what we think. On a very personal level, I cannot buy anything from shops like H&M or Primer or all these hor horrible things because I just it makes me extremely depressed. And I think I feel that these shops are giving uh, an impression of a world that is <laughs> impossible to continue so that but that's really on a personal level like i don't think i make i i help with that decision or i do something very good but on a personal level it is so far from the real reality and from the reality to which we should be heading i that i cannot see myself operating in that system even though i know i operate in it also when i don't buy thank you what I found very interesting, you both um, spoke about emotions. So you mentioned anger <laughs> and you like the depression that comes from buying something. So how to use these emotions also in, on a, in a political sense is something that interests me sometimes. But um, going now, because our conversation has its time limits, I, I would like to ask you, Lara, about your artistic work. And... Um, in your artistic work, you take a look at law with the tools of theater. And could you explain more how are politics and art interconnected within your practice? And could you explain that to us? And maybe because I found a quote in one of the interviews with you, where you spoke about using cultural institutions like theaters to try alternatives. Could you elaborate on that, please? Sure, uh, I'll try. Um, no, I think what is important for me is to situate a bit, a bit where we are uh, placing our work in today's societies, let's say. So um, I come from theater, that's important. I think the whole uh, thinking about the performative. Um, but I also think it's important to understand that um, in our, let's say, North European context after the Second World War, we entered into this very this idea of free art, and therefore it got very isolated also from society. So, of course, after fascism, it was extremely important to say there should be a non-ideological free space and this idea of free expression. Um, and I think that created a situation where we see art as something separate from society that you visit in, I don't know, black boxes and galleries. It became something therefore also very exclusive, elitist, um, something that, I mean, you can afford if you have, I mean, you go when you can afford or you go because you have the education and you feel it's important. Um, so I think there is already a very problematic development where we don't regard heart as something that is part of being a human really worldwide and that everyone should ac have access to and also that art is not something separate from society 
So for me, thinking about theater and performance is also thinking about reality. So if we think about the way the world operates, the way we are having this conversation, everything has to do with conventions, role-playing, performance. We're, we're making reality. And we do that uh, on the basis of certain codes, certain um, agreements, I think often unconscious. But somehow we forget that it can also be otherwise. So somehow we got so used to how things go that we see that as reality and then we go to theater to see fiction. Um, but I think what can what theater can do nowadays actually show that these um, differences are not so different, that the reality that we live in and the theater that tries out alternatives is actually very much close to each other and that um, theater can show how we're playing theater all the time. And if we're playing theater all the time, it means we can also play it differently. And that's, I think, what is very important. So we're not that powerless as we think, and we are co-creating systems that we are against every day. Of course, it's also not that easy. Um, so if it comes to um, what, we be, what we've been just um, speaking about, um, the injustice in the, in the clothing market is so huge and has, is so structural. Of course, we don't have the feeling that as an individual, we can quickly, by just role playing differently, change the world. But still, I would say that it's um, super important to acknowledge that the reality is not fixed and that um, through theater, we can also become much more aware of all the struggles in the past that people went through in order to change things and that things really changed because of it. Um, so that's that's one of the things. And then I think if I make it more concrete, because this is probably kind of meta answer, but still important for me. Um, I think I'm in my work, um, assembly is very important. And this idea of um, getting people together that maybe otherwise would not meet or not that easy or would not hear each other that, that easy. I think already the possibilities of theater to create a politicized space. I think we really lack politicized spaces because um, global capitalism is everywhere, because profit is everywhere. Um, where are the spaces where, where we can meet to talk about values, to talk about ethics, to talk about ideology, to talk about where we stand for as a society? Where can we exercise that? Where can we exercise also certain procedure, procedures? So I'm sure that we will talk about that later on. But if it comes to trials, how many of us witness trials? I don't think any of us citizens find the time to say, well, you know, let's check the website of the court, what's happening on Friday. Maybe there's a case that interests me. I want to follow what happened because these are fellow citizens. And, and whatever outcome happens there is also about me. It should be about me. And I think that's one of the reasons why trials for me became very interesting because I felt like, well, if the court cannot be so attractive for people, which of course has a lot to do with the language being used, all the thresholds, the bureaucracy, et cetera, et cetera, that is not there for nothing. So let's not simplify also. Uh, but maybe theater can play a role in that. And maybe theater can create a trial or a process or a people's tribunal or a political arena where people feel free to enter and to exercise um, appearance, articulation, thinking processes. Um, and I think that's, that's a very important place where we can inform ourselves, emancipate ourselves and exercise um, alternative futures. You have sent us a short compilation video of Europe on trial. And before we show it, um, could you tell us very shortly <laughs> what it is about, briefly. Um, I have been working with a group, a protest group, a refugee protest group in Amsterdam for a couple of years. Um, they are called We Are Here. And the title is very significant because what their protest was about was that at some point they decided collectively with a group of people to not hide anymore. So there's a systematic system in the Netherlands where people do not get asylum for various reasons because their identity hasn't been uh, clarified or because um, the Netherlands feel their countries are safe or whatever. Um, but for various reasons cannot be sent back. Uh, traumas, money, visa, whatever. 
And so they are put back to the street, basically, and with a message to just disappear. Um, and so this protest group was saying at some point, well, we are there, we exist, we are here, we are on the ground of this country, and um, you should acknowledge that. We're part of your responsibility. Um, around uh, we are here, uh, an organization started here to support with whom I did several artistic projects, trying to find a way of um, expressing, let's say, the injustice as if it comes to the position of refugees through artistic means. And um, after one project specifically, me and one of the spokesmen of We Are Here, Yunus Osmanur, had the idea to start a trial and to use theater to be able to start a trial um, against Europe uh, because of the many deaths in the Mediterranean if it comes to refugees um, seeking a refuge. Uh, of course, this was very much also in the time of, of the summer of the so-called refugee crisis, a very problematic term. Um, and we were feeling extremely powerless and extremely angry uh, because of what was happening. And we could not believe there was not something like a case against Europe, uh, against the European Union for closing all these very problematic deals with countries like Libya and Turkey, for pushbacks, for um, um, paying guards, Libyan uh, coast guards, for criminal criminalizing uh, captains that were actually trying to save people, etc, etc, etc. I mean, harbors that closed people on boats for days. We all know these um, terrible stories. And so um, we thought, well, we do not have access to something like the International Criminal Court, but we have access to theater. Mm. And maybe we can start already suing Europe uh, in a, let's say, fictional uh, space in, in, in the hope that somehow this fiction could haunt reality and could influence reality. And maybe just by speaking it out, something could become possible that maybe people thought before was not possible. Um, should I say more about I, the project, how it's been set up? I think that's... Like what you're going to see? I f first of all, I think that's also a good introduction first. We have time afterwards to discuss more. I'm already seeing um, uh, questions from the audience. Thank you for that, dear audience. But I would first put on now the video of the project that um, Lara just de described, Europe on Trial. And we'll see each other in some minutes after that again. This might look like a stage and it might look like theater, but it isn't. It might look like a performance, but it's really about uh, addressing the real issues uh, and the real challenges. There is no lawyer that will defend Europe. The speakers will all temporarily step into the shoes of expert witnesses, defense lawyer or prosecutor. But the most important role is reserved for you, the audience, the jury, but also the accused as citizens of Europe. Today I'm standing in front of you to accuse Europe of violations to human rights with regards to its asylum policies. I accuse the European Union of sending people back to places they have so desperately tried to flee, for being obsessed by statistics instead of ethics. Nobody chooses to be a refugee. I would say that by asking the European Union to live up to its moral obligations, we should be very careful in a time of mass migration in a time of disruption of many countries surrounding Europe to safeguard the moral middle ground and not overstating, attributing guilt. Are we willing to do as much as we possibly can? And the answer can only be yes or no, and it cannot be yes but. 
Say aye. aye. I call upon the indictment of Europe for colonialism. And before we think it's a thing of the past, let us remember of the ever morphing neocolonial practices of political control, occupation, ex economic exploitation, and a multinational corporation. Say aye. aye. I call upon the indictment of Europe for structural adjustment programs. Constant growth, 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 growth. At what cost? At all costs. Immigrants have become uh, a political capital of sorts for political parties. It's politically more sound to keep a problem in place than to actually solve it. I come by a boat. I never had passport in my life. I lost the possibility to live a normal life because I'm just not good at telling my story. I stand before you because the Dutch asylum system has failed me. My interview was a, a very big challenge to me because the questions that were really asked, most of them were very intimate. I belong to the LGBT community. Where I come from in our daily life, we don't normally talk about the kind of people we are. I stand here in front of you as a witness in a court case. A contemporary witness gives an account of time he or she has experienced and which now passed into history. I cannot tell about the time I have experienced, but I can tell about the time I have not experienced, the time that was stolen from me. The real effect of asylum law, among others, is the intentional prolonging of the period of time in which certain people are dependent. Europe completely drained Africa and the Middle East, drained it from resources, drained it from abled bodies. Time is money. They drained it from time. This is the debt that Europe owes everyone around it. And while there were no actors in this trial today and were standing in the historical court building of Amsterdam, we might see this event as artistic, or in other words, not real. Even in a court, we cannot erase subjectivities because courts are made by people and people are not objective. Subjectivity is present in every element of truth-seeking. It emphasizes the immense responsibility we have. Proven chosen here today is quite harsh, guilty or not guilty. If you stand up, it's guilty. If you sit, it's not guilty. There is no way in between in this forum. Today, we've showed that it's possible to say that Europe is guilty. And for me, the world looks different after such a verdict. Let's transform our guilt into responsibility. And let's act upon it. Thank you. So um, for me, the interest, interesting question, and for our audience too, um, is, Lara, how can art transgress art in the sense that it becomes reality? So that is a question from the audience. And could you answer to that? Um, I think there are two possible answers. Um, one of it, sorry, I'm so, sometimes a bit confused because sometimes I see myself double in the screen and then you come back. So now you're back. That's great. Um, that's sometimes a bit. Uh, I think there are two possible um, answers. One of it is a more abstract and complex answer. And that is that I think that we're very used in our thinking in general, if it comes to art or otherwise, to think into very clear ideas of quantified impact. So the question is always, what was the impact? How did you change your world? How, do, how has reality been, been changed? And I think that's a bit of a risky approach, although of course it's important to keep on asking it because it could be easy also saying like, well, you know, everything changes always and we don't know how. Um, but it's a risky approach because I don't think that's how democracies work. And I think that's also not how history worked. And I think we can see that. So 
I think at the basis of a lot of things that change in history, there have been multiple struggles. But it's almost never a linear story. It's almost never the story of one hero deciding something and then masses of people would follow and then for days there were, was a process and then bam, there was a new law. It's almost never the case. It's after years of years of hard struggle, invisible struggle, precarious struggle, and the moment that is right and that the society is really able to put so much pressure that there's really a change uh, is not something you can direct or top organize top down and is something that makes us often forget all the hard work that has been done years before. Um, so I think it's a bit the same with this, with an art project that um, it is difficult to tell how your trial changed anything because it's often processes that are also invisible. So it's often about many conversations that happened afterwards. People seeing a work, people participating, people then continuing certain things. Um, ideas that are generated through a project. So it's, it's in that sense, um, hopefully every project creates some sort of change and that's not always seeable or quantifiable. I think that's, which doesn't mean it was not useful. I think that's one part of the answer. And the other part of the answer is that I think that it's very important to uh, form alliances. So I think one of the consequences of this idea that art should be autonomous or free expression or in a free uh, non-politicized space is that we artists often work alone or feel that we are the real creators and we have the imagination and, and we come up with these um, fantastic ideas. And that's really something for me personally that's interesting in, interested in political art um, is um, um, a reason really to, to see artistic works as something that always are in alliance or in collaboration with other organizations, with political organizations, with NGOs, with legal organizations. And that it's very important that if we are serious about ourselves, that first of all, we cannot solve the problem by, by ourselves. Second of all, artistic mm, production is often very precarious, very, I don't know, it's one moment, one subsidy, never enough, people overwork, blah, blah. So it's very important to have strong institutions that are able also to, to create more sustainable uh, work or lines or continue the work afterwards. Um, you need expertise, you need people. So what is great, I, I think that uh, something that artists can do is this role of the amateur, right? I'm not a lawyer, but I'm interested in law and I'm interested in trials and I'll just try to create my own trial, you know, and of course I've been speaking to lawyers and to experts, but because I'm an amateur, I can have this bluntness, I can just do it and, and try to change it from within because I don't have all the rules and all the, all the details in mind and that's something good. But on the same time, I need someone that tells me, well, what you're now going to do is very problematic or here I see a lot of potential, you should just go deeper. Um, so I think one of, I mean, crit my critical point after your point trial was that it was not embedded enough and that it's very important that if you're serious about your political aims, that you really start to collaborate from the beginning. Yes, thank you, Lara. So for me, the question also was um, in your project, um, Europe on trial, putting Europe on trial is different than the work you do, Miriam, in Etzitzaia. Um, it's more of a symbolic accuse of a whole community. Um, and this is a question now to you both, um, because we see the atrocities that are happening at European borders. We know about them. And um, can we put Europe on trial? Uh, first of all, that for, for you, Miriam. Um. Yeah, there, there there are a couple of that actually realized into into actually real legal actions, and um, in uh, but I would say no, you cannot put Europe on trial because in law a lot of times you do need to argue for you need to have a very fine argument on attributing responsibilities, and I think as law is made up, I don't think law would have to be this way, but at at the moment as it is made up, you know there are a number of bar barriers to arguing this. Um, but still, I think sort of on how we try to go about this is to say we, we want to stay within the boundaries of law and sort of the, 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 or the, the 
a variety of legal arguments you can use, but then you know push the law a, a step beyond that, and um, sort of to be to to say because we do want to be taken seriously in the sense of that this is a case that everyone really needs to look into seriously that you know the judges cannot just dismiss and say oh this has just been made for publicity, but again to be still thinking is how can you go a step further with that. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Which is interesting because uh, art can actually do this also. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> and, and I think I, I really like what Lara just uh, just said because I think also this idea of creating um, a space where you can think about something alternatively, you know, or where you can say, you know, the future could be different. Um, and I think this is very much uh, also how, how I would see... Um, our cases, you know, because it's, it's, um, we actually also have the same debate. So of course, you know, critical lawyers say, oh, you know, what do you think? What is, you know, is law ever changing reality? Is not using the law, meaning reinforcing the whole system and reinforcing mm. power structures. Da, 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 da. And to some extent it is. And then the question is, so it can law ever be emancipatory? Can you ever use it for something different? And then I would say, well, you know, I, I'm also not really sure. I'm I, Not one case, even if it's one, is not going to change everything. And, and I also think it's, it's exactly this. You know, you need to work in broader alliances. It cannot be just the experts on law. It must be political actors. It must be people on the ground. People must be the claimants need to have, I think... Um, at best know what their political goal is actually also beyond this why do they want to go to court what is it that they want to claim there not just to hope to get justice because our justice system is you know difficult and often not re you know giving justice but so you know but that you can work with what you why you're bringing this forth um and and i think so one example is um the case we've been doing with Pakistani workers that have lost family members in a large factory fire in Pakistan in 2012. And they went to the court of Dortmund in Germany um, and claiming compensation from the retailer that had ordered the jeans that their children were producing and that died then in the fire. And I think this moment, you know, there's everything. The law says we're all equal, which in reality they are not equal. But this, you know, this woman and those other, like Saida Khatun um, and the other three claimants, they are able to go to court and say for this one moment, imagine what would the world look like if every Pakistani worker could go to the court of Dortmund and claim their rights for every vi rights violation, if that was standard. Mm. And then if it was standard, that actually kick does wear, bear responsibility, that they actually do have to care what is happening and that they do need to make up for the costs that their production causes, the real costs, no? not just the little money they pay for the product. And, and I think sort of, you know, you have this also in, in, this, in this courtroom and it's, of course, asking this question and say it could be different and she could win now. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, we've out, laid out even legal arguments why this would be possible to do and we know why, you know, judges reframe from doing this and don't want to do this and how the company defends. But I think it's also this creating uh, something that you can think differently about rela power relationships, about justice and about how how powerful actors should be held to account. And um, Lara... In that sense, interesting. Oh, yeah, please, sorry. Please no, I on. just, I was thinking because it's interesting that we see that a lot of um, cases lately, so I would be interested to know how you feel about that, Miriam, but in my opinion, from my, from my perspective, I have to think that the court became at certain places and moments these last years more and more politicized, and that it has been used also by activists. So almost this feeling of like, well, um, let's say conventional um, protest doesn't help that much in our mediatized world, etc. So what can be other ways? So if we look at the Urgenda case in the Netherlands, for example, where the Netherlands was sued because they don't actually live up to their own promises if it comes to climate change, uh, the Shell case, um, that's quite interesting. Let's say, and I know that in the Netherlands there is this huge debate of, oh, this is very problematic, our trias politica, and, you know, the court should be neutral and now it gets politicized. But I actually feel no, but that's exactly the place it should be because it is politicized, because it's about how do we want to live, to what um, uh, rules and values. Um, and so in that sense, I was also very intrigued in this um, difference, like uh, the court creates the truth. Huh? In court, we speak the truth and in theater, it's fiction. But in a way, 
um, these are very much close to each other because a lot of, and that's also with asylum cases um, the case, um, courts or trials create precedents. So, of course, we're looking every time that there is a revolutionary outcome, then other people can understand. I mean, it's exactly what Mariam was just saying, uh, can say, well, okay, so then I'm hurt. So now there's a basis. Um, Shell doesn't have the right to pollute and make people sick, etc., on such um, um, a scale, not, not one single person. Uh, and that changes reality drastically. So you spoke right now both of the emancipatory potential of these kind of fusions, but um, we spoke about that, Lara, before we had this conversation. Now, what, what, what do you think could be, and also you, Miriam, what could be the problematic of such an artistic approach or where we don't really know where's the fiction, where's the reality? Um, do you have opinions on that? Um, I, I want to move a bit. I have of especially opinions about when can courts also be problematic. And, and I think um, uh, one remark, you know, this idea that courts are neutral is uh, in itself, well, law is always politics, political, no? And courts are political. And I think if people then say, oh, this is getting politicized, it just means that uh, the hegemono hegemony of a certain political thinking is being challenged, right? And that makes everyone feel uneasy. But it's not like, I mean, everything, you know, I don't know. Um, uh, civil law, all kinds of family law, it's all actually political. So that's one. And then what can be problematic, I think, about court proceedings, and I agree with you, there is a more, a more of a tendency to say we are using courts, and I think this is good to some extent that people in, especially from countries where, you know, production takes place, typically in the global south that they feel we're just doing this let's go you know we let's go to the netherlands and try this i think it's important because it's sort of bringing back the um their voices no uh, to 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 europe and it, it makes it a bit our um you know pollution and all the exploitation a bit less avoidable the problem is obviously if we really believe that the courts will solve this you know, and that we're only hoping for the right judgment and then things will be fine, which is not true. No, for if one, the right judgments often don't come. So what do you do then? So I think that's, and, and um, so what is problematic about arts? I think, um, no, I, I don't see there's much about it. I think there's, it's, it's mutually reinforcing. And I think sometimes what I do feel we don't ask, you know, probably, you know, setting up a fictionary court is easier to some extent because you don't have to stick to all those technicalities and stupid rules. Um, but at the same time, I don't want to sort of, I think it need, needs to be both because we need to use the real law and challenge the real law. Mm -hmm. no? So I think it, it's simply not, it's not an either or. And so that's why, why I think it's, it's how, how to um, re, you know, use both tools to mutually reinforce. Yeah, no, I very much agree. I very much agree. By the way, Kaija, you were saying that uh, there's like, can it? Can we put Europe on trial? But a year after our project, and of course, it doesn't have any direct relation. But this case lies now at the ICC, the International Criminal Court, uh, by two lawyers that um, accuse the European Union also for their uh, deals with Libya and the relationship to Libya if it comes to the many deaths on the Mediterranean Sea. So that was good news. On the same time, of course this now takes years to investigate if it's really a case and then it hasn't even started the process. So um, I think that's a good example in a way like why uh, we didn't want to wait for that. And we felt there was a people's consciousness or a people's moral position that needed to be addressed. So let's not only wait for the institution, but let, let's first already take responsibility or try to take responsibility. So that is also why it's not a classical trial, but it's a people's tribunal where the people were actually, that were sitting there, were both representing the accused as citizens of Europe and the ones voting also. So it's kind of making a judgment about yourself or your community. Thank what you can know. be problematic about art? Um, one of the things that, that was very difficult within Europe on trial is the, the people that were um, working with us from We Are Here and from the, um, the the refugee shelter because of course um, they stand there and they in a way finally have a space where they can speak in their tempo in their words and they can be heard on the same time 
uh, this project couldn't in any way offer them a different reality. And so I asked them to go through their pain, through their wounds, have this hope, this excitement of the possibility to be heard, and then there's nothing, right? They just go back to their same shitty situation where they don't even have a roof above their head during the day, they need to be on the streets. Um, um, I mean, I can go on and go on about um, how difficult that, that life is and how unfair. Um, and, and I think that's why I wouldn't do this again without stronger partners, because you need aftercare and you need to offer some sort of perspective and you need to invest if you're serious about it and you, you ask them to trust you and to share their stories, um, you need to, to offer them something. And, uh, and I think that was, this was a very precarious project on a lot of levels. There wasn't enough money, resources, blah, blah. And that's not, then, then it becomes a, a dangerous thing. And I, and I think we handled it well in, in the way we could. But uh, ideally, parallelly, you should invest in a, real, in a real case course, right? Yeah, absolutely. Lara, you, you just spoke about the people you worked with and in your next project, um, you, the state of justice, you are um, looking at or is working together with Samuel. And um, I, I would just really ask you, what are the stories of injustice you're working with on the personal level? Because we just spoke very meta about everything, but can you share maybe this new work coming up? Yeah, so in a way, it's a, a kind of part two of Europe on trial, but then completely different approach. Um, I think the whole situation, if it comes to uh, refugees and asylum policy, didn't got better, right? It only got worse, if you ask me, which creates a lot of questions around how to deal with that as an artist or a curator or whatever within artistic means as a, as a political citizen. Uh, because in a way, I'm 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 even more angry. I'm very bitter. I find I find us in a very dark in very dark, dark times. So where do I find some sort of um, hope or idea that it makes sense what I do? And then I think again this question about where do you place it? Uh, because what does it mean to so maybe sorry more concrete? Um, it's still working with here to support and we are here and um, they have observed these last years that there is a, a huge group of uh, minors or teenage um, Eritrean boys and girls coming to Europe and uh, they are often in extremely vulnerable situation. They've been traveling for years because it's really hell uh, what they go through to even reach the Mediterranean, then the boat, then arriving in Italy or in Switzerland very bad circumstances. Um, then they, they travel to, to the Netherlands, for example, and they again have to wait. And a lot of these cases are being denounced, so they're, they're not acknowledged, uh, which is strange if you ask me. But moreover, they're often not treated as minors. And that's, of course, a legal thing. So if they can prove that they are under 18, they enter into different law and in a different framework. And often they cannot prove this because they don't have a birth certificate and they have to ask family members to witness because, but they're foreign in dictatorship and stuff. So it's very complicated. And often they traveled so long that they were 14 or 15 when they left home, but they, they the moment that they reach, let's say the immigration office, they maybe turn just 18. And then they're treated very differently or 19 or 20. But in a way, they they are completely traumatized teenagers still, and this is not uh, not at all acknowledged in how they are treated. And I work with one of them, uh, Samuel, and we're trying to uh, create a monologue based on his dossier, on his um, story, but on the same time on many similar stories because it's really a bigger problem for him. That's also very important to underline. It's not about him as an individual. And the monologue is constantly playing with who's speaking. So who's speaking here? Is this the boy on who the case is based, Samuel? Is it the actor that performs it? Is it the author who wrote it? Is it the many other similar cases that are happening? And therefore it's trying to raise many questions about how it's possible um, that such a case in, the, in, in Europe because it, it, it's called the state of justice, but we're kind of working with this metaphor of a field court. So for us, 
um, the law system completely fails, the asylum system completely fails on people like him. And if you look at him, and he is a beautiful, young, very light presence, and he would never say a text like I've written for him. And I deliberately play with this um, huge discrepancy between all the hope that he as an 18 year old have and all this huge dark things that happened to him and he's still standing there but he's standing there in this stage um in europe in ghent and of course that raises also questions so okay what does it mean in our art bubbles we watch those stories we debate them and then what so that's something i'm also very much busy with like how can i again for this project find partners but also can art not only create a place for reflection for discussion, for analysis, but a place to act. Because I think we're all very powerful. You constantly feel very powerless. And there are a lot of people who want to help or do something, but they just, they just don't know how. Can we use our artistic imagination to just really make space to act, even if it's a small gesture, to somehow balance this complete discrepancy between all these things we know about the extreme injustice our system, and I think Miriam expressed it really beautiful and very, it's huge confrontation. So our entire system in the global north is based on exploitation constantly, historically, presently. And that's just very hard to live with. So we are in this schizophrenia where we're trying to forget often um, that that's the case. But I think it would almost be some sort of collective therapy if we could somehow place this um knowledge that we have together with action mm -hmm. uh, because that's really what we are longing for i think we want to change but we feel very powerless and we're not that powerless i hope still yes for for me i always try to end or find an end to conversations like this with a sense of hope and um you spoke about the artistic imagination of projects like you're doing um Tonight, later, we will show in this series the Congo Tribunal, which you both know, and um, a project by Milo Rau and the IIPM, which tries to recreate justice in a theatrical trial. And um, as you're both closely connected to this project, I, I would really like to hear your opinions on, on, on this project and maybe also, yeah, the hope it may give or, um, yeah, so... Please. <laughs> Miriam. <laughs> um, well, I think the hope it gives, um, and I think that probably is, I, I, it's quite well, I think, also researched and analyzed that um, there is a great importance for people that have experienced violence, trauma, um, injustice, to speak about this and to get some sort of acknowledgement even if not necessarily, you know, much follows. So I think this this being able to to speak about it and have witnesses that actually hear this, I think has in itself a value. And I think that's at least what... Also, I when I talk to people, I always get also that sense. I know for, for um, Saida Khatun, she was, of course, disappointed that the court didn't um, allow her case to go forward, but I know it meant a lot to her to be in Germany and to speak to people and to meet people and to um, also to see that people that there are also people that care. No, so obviously it doesn't. And, and you're right. We need to think more about how how can something still improve and change in the situation. But I think um, lives can also be touched through this. And I think also people can. Um, I think they've always had dignity, but probably they can experience their own dig dignity in a deeper sense or in a different sense. No. Um, and, but what I like about the Congo Tribunal is, and I think that's really, you can say, this is the um, advantage of, of using art, is that it was able to, I think it is able to show connections and to, to make uh, the, the, the audience understand the problems, the conflicts that evolve on the, uh, in Congo and how they are connected to us in a much broader sense than 
Well, I felt because it's you, you, you can experience it more. I think that's even better than reading, uh, you know, an article in a newspaper or in a journal and definitely better than in a court case, because I think in court you need to be so, you know, you're also creating a narrative, obviously, but it must be so narrowed down to what is important to fit the criteria of this law and how do you prove this? No, so there it's quite. And so you always narrow the story down. And I think we are always struggling with this that we feel like, well, we, we want to make people understand the context of this, you know, what is really and I think this is what this uh, this film really beautifully shows and i feel like yeah i i, I personally felt like i understand so much better really how things work uh, and 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 why people are trapped in the situations they are and uh, and also on how power works in this yes no i very much agree that i think there's something very important um probably that's maybe something you could better um judge um, Miriam, but probably also the fact that it was an art movie helped politically making it possible because it just so that's one advantage of the fact that we think art doesn't have any power and you know every uh, nice country wants to do something with art and show that well we have a critical voice. One of the good things of that is that of course well it's just an art project you know why bother and then actually very political things can happen and that can have also an impact later. And I think this aspect uh, that Miriam just uh, said about storytelling and that you can take a freedom. And therefore, for example, for me, it's extremely important to work with artists and spoken word artists also in, in, in fictional court, so to say, uh, or in assemblies, is that I think there's something about the speech act um, that can have much um, wider reach and that that's very important. In a way, I would love to look at cases uh, and, and, and procedure, judicial procedures with artists, if it comes to dramaturgy, if it comes to rhetorics, because I think there's something that can be more accessible and then the political aspects can be also much more part of the debate. And then you already you would have probably much more porous walls between what's happening in, in court and what's happening in society. Um, and I think that's that's very important. And I think the Congo Tribunal does that very beautifully. I think uh, it's a beautiful example of how an art project can have real impact, not only for the people being hurt, etc. But there was this governor that really resigned. So I mean, that's that's huge. Um, it does also raise its questions, like it means that Milo Rao as a white Swiss male director needed to, during the procedure, make friends with all sides, with both parties, right? He had to gain the trust from both uh, sides in order to make the procedure happening. And I find that interesting and problematic and um, it still keeps me busy in a way. He needed to gain the trust of that governor and he was able to, and it was actually very important um because that made it possible for the people there to really share their rage right to the people because that's often what happens i think in our art projects is like why are the people responsible not sitting here we don't get the people from the big corporations we don't get the right wing voters in our spaces right so we talk about them but we want to speak to them in their face we want to and it's important um and I think that's, so it's both, let's say something I admire extremely within the Congo Tribunal project. And I also still keep on questioning what it means morally. And maybe there's something about this outsider's position that Milo had that made it, um, that made that possible. Maybe having privilege also means that, okay, you need to sometimes step over your own ideological position for greater good. Um, yeah, that would be, let's say, the very, no, I, I, no, I agree with that. And then I have a question if it comes to um, the way the project has been crediting and the way the project has been placed into the world. I sometimes feel that we are still very much an art system that creates this kind of Milo Rao artist doing this. Where is it so clear? And then we come back to alliances that many people worked on it, many Congolese people, many organizations, many lawyers, Miriam was involved, so many others. So, I mean, I feel sometimes that we, these kind of projects could also be emancipatory in that sense. This was not a single man's project, even though he's super important and he should be there. 
but it's a it's a collective project and that made it possible and it made it also possible to have this huge impact and then i think the consequence of the hearings that still continue and i just saw today that the video i was thinking this is so important it's it didn't stop with that project it's still continuing the hearings are continuing the project was given to other people to continue that should become a second movie because this first movie is maybe very much let's say the sensation and the interest and it's an extremely important movie but then the hard struggle starts right okay and now how to continue and that's happening and i would love a movie with the same amount of attention for that process as well thank you regarding to the time i i remember one last public uh audience question it's um, a little bit gone now from my uh, view but it was about the question of um, timing mm. and um, you said so maybe because we're also timing our conversation now <laughs> maybe the last questions to that um, how late are we so like we're doing all of this and um, but yeah what is the what is the idea of timing in, in the art or, or the practice you do? And what has to, do you understand my question? Or should I rephrase that? <laughs> well, I, um, well, timing, I, I can think of two, two aspects of this. So one is I thought like, oh, that's so interesting because we talk a lot about this the question. So, you know, how do you create impact with a case? Um, because there are many cases and you can all have all great arguments and y you, you may still not have much of an impact in the wider political debates that might be necessary. Um, and so, of yeah, and so timing and when you file the right case is important. So already, by the way, you know, legally, it's important that you don't miss your stupid statute of limitations period time, you know, so it must be on time. But also, you know, to have a wider impact, it must be the right case at the right moment. And I don't think it always is. No, I think that can be sometimes where you feel like, well, this, you know, in this current de political debate, it will not be picked up in the right way. It can be completely understood wrong and so on and so on. I think... So in that, in a narrow sense, timing. And I don't know if you meant timing in the sense, of course, if you think this in, uh, you know, the, in terms of climate justice or the climate crisis we're in. Um, I, yeah, I'm, uh, um, well, if you, I, if, if you listen and believe the scientists, obviously we have no time. Mm. But, it's, <laughs> but then I also feel like, well, this is, this is not um, a political... We can't work with this politically, you know, because we can't, we cannot pretend, I mean, the world will probably become devastated and everything will be terrible, but we can't live on the assumption we only have seven years and what then, you know, so, so I would say that in that regard, if you think this more, you know, uh, we need to continue fights and as you as Lara also said it's a lot of times it's it takes long time and it takes much time and probably a lot of changes hap have happened in history also too late for many people too late right um, so in that regard yes it's important to have a sense of urgency um, and at the same time I feel if you create too much urgency it takes away political thinking mm. because we you know, if it, it, it because yeah, if there's not enough time, then should we stop doing what we do today? I mean, you know, it, it feel like it paralyzes also to some extent. Uh, you know, I understand. Yes, you can also drive people with urgency into political action, but I feel like it's not the best concept if you think in terming timing in terms of urgency. I can very much relate again to what Miriam is saying. So I can only add things. Um, I think timing is uh, within political art or within a case extremely important indeed like Mar Miriam is saying so the, if you study why certain momentum certain moments became very political or resulted in a in a mass protest for example it has to do with timing but the complicated thing is that you cannot always predict that also so so that's of course i think the beautiful and frustrating thing with democracy we are all together co-creating it and we're not marionettes that you can direct from top down so timing cannot be um completely directed from above you can have an intuition this is a good moment it it touches upon topics that are but i mean i was very surprised with the european trial uh, project that it didn't raise much more i mean we had attention sure but it could have been much more uh, and I was very 
surprised also because we were living this uh, after summer refugee crisis thing and it was very much in people's minds. Um, so why didn't it became a bigger thing or not big enough in, in my taste? Very difficult to understand. Yeah, many reasons probably. And I think this whole thing of attention, we're in this kind of attention society, all competing for attention, all competing for the attention of journalists, completely feeling dependent on journalists in order to have some sort of impact, which is also terrible. So sometimes it also helps me to think, you know what, you do something because you feel it's urgent, connected to other people's urgencies, and you feel, well, at least for us this makes sense, and it would be beautiful if it, you know, the bomb bursts and it gets, you know, infected, and so many other people will come along. And if not, it doesn't mean it was useless. Because in the end, I agree with me, I'm like, you can, you can wait forever or the, or, the, or the right moment, but we're anyway too late. And indeed, that doesn't help. So I think this feeling of we're too late already, which I think is very strong for certain of us, for, for some of us, is more paralyzing. Uh, although it's still, I mean, it's it can be effective, I think, because a lot of people are still so much busy with short term, it's not imaginable how that is still possible. Um, so it's not a completely useless concept, but uh, we need to make it productive and things cost time. We're in democracies, it's slow processes. Uh, and there are reasons for that also. So I don't know, I, I tell myself again that some struggles took very long, but in the end did make a change. Yeah, I, I, while you were speaking, I, I had to remember one um, one thing I like to, rem like one example from history I, I find very interesting, that is um, the Nuremberg trials and then the Frankfurt trials in the 60s, right? So the Nuremberg trials obviously were the birthplace where this idea of individual responsibility for grave crimes was put out for the first time and it had very little and so it's groundbreaking absolutely important but it had very little resonance in the german public and um it did not uh, create a different narrative as to you know it was hitler and a couple of bad other people very up and none of us you know everyone else has nothing had nothing to do with this um, and so, and then obviously it took until the mid '60s that um, the Nuremberg, uh, the, the Frankfurt trials could start. And obviously they happened also not. It was not just Fritz Bauer as a prosecutor putting this case together. Obviously you can. It was Frankfurt. It was a particular point in time. Uh, you know, you had the Frankfurt School. You had, uh, you know, a social democratic um, a govern uh, like government of uh, of Hesse. And, um, and so it took all those circumstances and that trial really had an important influence on the German debate and perception of everyone's and or more, or well, basically ordinary people's responsibility, you know? And, and so I think that's, but, and, and obviously in between Nuremberg and Frankfurt, there was, people worked on this. Fritz Bauer has been working for this for a long time and he was not alone, no? So, um, and so I think, again, also of course, not alone, larger constellations and, and I think, that is where I find like, well, you know, so at a certain point in time, work can have, or for me it was, you know, law and legal procedures can really have an impact on a wider and really change realities, I would say. But obviously, you know, it's, it's not planable as you've put this also out well, you know, and we can't know exactly always, no? Thank you, Miriam. Lara, Miriam, I took a lot from this conversation. And I'm very happy that you both met today. And um, thank, thank you, you to the audience for asking these very also important questions. Um, at 7 p.m. Uh, Berlin time, we will show this before mentioned Congo Tribunal. For all Facebook watchers, please uh, switch to www.adk.de, www.adk.de, where you can watch uh, the movie. Afterwards, we will have a conversation with the human rights lawyer Celine Cisena, who's involved in the Congo Tribunal, Harald Welzer, the sociologist, um, the choreographer Nora Cipermaire, and um, it will be hosted by Dorothy Wehner, a curator and film critic. So, thank you all for watching. Thank you for being here, Miriam. Thank you for being here, Lara. And see you soon. Thank you. Thank you.